You know, today, as, as we're kind of diving into the book of Luke, where Luke captures this, this account uh, of this episode about Jesus and, and these four fishermen. And some of you who have grown up in the church setting would have read this story one too many times. But I pray tonight, God would really give us a fresh understanding of this scripture. Because come on, this is the timeless truth that we are meditating on. Amen? That, and God can still speak to us through, through this lesson. And, and I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. We'll read from verses 1 to 11. It says, One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge. For the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. And this uh, uh, was five. Then, then he, Master Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners into the other, in, the, in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. How many of you are secretly saying, I want a miracle like that? Anybody? Right? Sinking boats. Overflow. Right? Everybody wants that. Both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left, somebody say, they left everything and followed Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. God, we want to thank you for the scripture. We want to thank you, God, for this account and this story that was captured so many thousands of years ago. But even today, God. Your word is alive, your word is powerful, and this is the timeless truth that we need in our time-bound seasons. So Father, we pray for the truth and the power of your word to enlighten us in the name of Jesus. We commit this time into your mighty hands, Lord. Amen. Amen. You see, this, this account that is, that is captured by Luke, Luke has gone on gone into Luke is always known to go into some of the details that the other gospel writers will kind of you know just casually miss out and I want to talk about some of the observations and some of the some of the key things that Luke captures in this and 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 I'm calling this talk the great transition because in this in this piece of scripture is not just a miracle in this piece of scripture is not just a timely provision in this piece of scripture is not just you know God teaching you that when when the Lord comes in your boat a miraculous catch happens all that is true somebody say all that is true but there is something more that the the writer Luke is drawing your attention and my attention to as we have been reading these few verses yes the catch that happened was a t maybe the talk of the town and, and for those of you who have started watching Chosen, or if you have finished watching Chosen, you know, you, you'd be getting a completely different glimpse of this particular scenario when you see it, and, and the context, and the, and the background to how this scenario plays out. <clears throat> but I want to bring us back for the next few minutes on just this one phrase, and if there's one phrase you can, like, just take down in your hearts, take down maybe on a notepad, on your phones, I want to talk about the great transition, because when Peter starts this this conversation with Jesus. He starts this conversation after Jesus has finished a conversation with the crowds. 
You know, by the way, I, I was, when I was in my teens, I was reminded about how Jesus was strategic. You know, somebody said, how did Jesus preach to the crowds? And this is a classic example where physics and, and you know, uh, like uh, there's a lot of combination that came, comes into play. Somebody had put it in this way. Jesus got onto the boat because he used the, the power of the wind for his voice to travel and everything. And I was like, wow, I never thought about all of that. You know, does that, does that work, Nikhil? Maybe, okay. You know, all the guys, all the sound engineers, if you're wondering, how did Jesus, how, the, how did the sound crew do sound for Jesus' crusades? Jesus was very strategic, you know, he, he used the boat, he pushed it out, and he's like, homies, let the wind do the talking for me, you know. But, but you know, I remember all of those things when the preachers were, were, used to talk about how Jesus was so strategic about every conversation that he had with his people. And, and be, be, behind and underneath that strategy is also something that Jesus is doing in the life of these four people by not talking to those four people directly. Have you ever had or been in a part of certain conversations where somebody is not talking to you but those words are still convicting you? You know what that feels like? And, and that's what Jesus did. Jesus finishes talking to the crowd and then he starts a conversation with, with Peter. He's like, hey man, why don't you just launch out into the deep like some of your Bible translations would be saying. Just launch out into the deep. Now, now again, you might have heard this if you've grown up in church that the, the, the structural piece of this conversation where it's wrong is a carpenter telling a fisherman what to do. Now that's, those are ego problems. Right? Oh, we don't have ego problems. We really don't have ego problems among us, you know. When somebody, when somebody knows that you're gifted at something, but yet tells you to do something contrary that, to something that you've already been doing. And, and Peter is, is kind of, I think Peter is being genuine in his response. Because for, for one of the few times, Peter is not being cocky. Like he always is. For one of the few times, Peter is not being short-tempered. For one of the few times, Peter is saying, but he's, he's still being, you know, in his silent obedience, he's still saying, Lord, I tried it. Entire night I was fishing, I tried it. And I was, I couldn't help but think how many times we have said the same thing to Jesus. God, I tried it. I tried it, God. I, I, I really tried to get better at this. I really tried to, to, to not allow these things to really dominate me or capture my attention or not get frustrated. Because whether you like it or you see it or you don't see it, Jesus is talking to a bunch of people who are frustrated from not getting any catch the entire night. And that conversation is a bad one. That's like, that's like next level of hangry. You know, nowadays the word, uh, the people around us talk to us about, hey, don't talk to me, I'm hangry. I was like, okay. But this is another bunch, another level of frustration where they're fished for the entire night, not caught anything. And Jesus is calling them and telling them, let's go into the deep. Now, the word that, like I said, Luke captured a word, a couple of words in this. And, and you see that in verse 5, where Luke says, Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. You see, right, this time Peter's obedience is a genuine obedience that you, that you see that Luke is capturing. It's a, it's a genuine obedience to what Jesus is asking. Because let me tell you something. Peter has a reference point to every word that comes out from the mouth of Jesus. Because what you, what you might want to consider is just above the above chapter, in chapter 4, something radical has happened in the family of Peter. You remember Peter's mother-in-law being healed? Let's read those two verses. Chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, verses 38 and 39. This is in Peter's house. After Jesus is done talking to the crowds in the synagogue, Jesus went to Simon's house where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with high fever. Please heal her, everyone what? Begged. Standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever and it left her and she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. Now see, church, Peter has a reference point to everything that Jesus is saying. Peter is very much considerate 
about the words that have come out from the mouth of Jesus. So though it doesn't, though, though it doesn't make sense, he is still willing to obey. Does it sound familiar in our lives? Sometimes the word of God, the promises of God doesn't make sense in the realities of your life. But I wonder how many of us will still say, God, because you are saying it, I will still do it. And Peter is modeling over here something that, something that, that your faith and my faith hinges on is the principle and the posture of obedience. Peter is modeling obedience over here because some of the, the most radical decision is a, is a decision of simple obedience to God. Some of you need to stop overthinking things. Can I say that one more time? Or oh, you are saying it to yourself already? Some of you really need to stop overthinking things and simply... No, no, come on, simply... Some of us need, need this one word which is good enough sermon for us that can take us on for this one month or maybe even this, this quarter of 2023. Simple obedience is beautiful in the sight of God. Simple obedience is, is the most radical thing a Jesus follower can do. So, so maybe it's time we take stock of and ask ourselves, where is God asking you and I to obey? Can you maybe ask, ask the person who's sitting next to you, do you know where God is asking you to obey? Which area of your life? Which area of your life is God asking you to obey? Yeah, I know this is not something that you would want to use as a conversation starter for somebody who's sitting next to you. Anybody got answers? Yeah? You know, we have become so good at these classic smiles that we give to the questions that I ask, you know. It's like, that's the only time I get the best of your smiles. But I'll continue. I'll continue. The most radical decision is a decision of simple obedience to God. Because when Luke captured this word, in the Greek... Master and Lord have certain same words in Greek, but there are a couple of words that speak into the specifics of that situation. And when Luke was saying uh, master over here, when Luke wrote master over here, one of, the, one of the specific Greek words that was used in that particular conversation was this, this idea that implies you are the boss. Somebody say you are the boss. You know, that's the language Peter is using. That's the language Luke has captured. Where it's saying that, you know what? Okay, you're the boss. Because you're saying it, I'm going to do it. But, but here's something that behind that, un uh, underneath that obedience that Peter is modeling, there is still, th this obedience is kind of based on a transactional gesture from Peter. Because you're saying it, I'll do it. How many of us have had transactional conversations with Jesus? Come on. Right? Because you say it, because you want me to do it, because your word says, I'll do it. I don't feel like doing it, but, but I'll still go ahead and do it. You know, that's a transactional kind of conversation where we don't understand the value of the words that Jesus is asking us to obey. And he is, Jesus and Peter, when they're having this conversation, that's how they're communicating. That's what Luke captures, that, okay, where he's saying, okay, you might be the boss, and that's why I'm doing it. But he's still holding on to the frustration that, that he has. As Peter, he's still holding on that, I don't know if Jesus understands what we have gone through the entire night. But here's something beautiful about this. Jesus and Jesus alone knows how to speak best into your frustrated moments of your life. Jesus knows exactly how to speak into those seasons where everything looks meaningless. Jesus and Jesus alone knows exactly how to speak and, and use a language and use scenarios that you and I can resonate with. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But the word that Luke is using where Peter, he's saying, okay, you're the boss. And you know, when, when that happens, when the catch happens, that's where Peter's heart change really is caught. You know where... The miraculous catch is not enough. As though the miraculous catch is not enough, Peter 
helps, helps us understand by saying something that is so different. He says, Lord, depart from me. How many of us have kept God at a distance when he has still been good to you? You see why? Because it, it speaks a lot about the independent spirit that we like to hold on to. It speaks a lot about some of the stubborn natures that we as humans have. That when God is curating something in our lives, we are still not able to capture and understand what is happening. But, but let me tell you this, Peter, is, there's also something different that's happening in that very moment. In that very moment, Peter is having a revelation of who is this person who's asking him to launch out into the deep. Peter is having a revelation of what it looks like, and that's the great transition that I want to talk to you about. When Peter says, oh Lord, you see how the transition has happened in the spur of a moment. One moment he was frustrated, he was disappointed, there was no catch. In another moment there is a catch, and then in another moment, in that same few moments, he's saying, oh Lord, depart from me. The great transition that we are seeing in Peter's life is somebody who's relating to somebody from a transactional way, to finally saying, Lord, depart from me. And you see, for many seasons of our lives, we can continue to relate to Jesus in a transactional manner. For many seasons of our lives, our prayer life, our spiritual formation, and, and everything that happens in our life is very transactional with God. But can I tell you this? He's patient with us even through that time. But there's a great transition that Luke has modeled where Peter's response is in awe and reverence to the catch that he's seen. But Peter's uh, response is also in awe and reverence to the one who's standing before him. He's now getting a glimpse of who this guy, who this, who this person is. He's saying, okay, you what? You're not just the boss. You're not just the master. You are the Lord of my life. You see, right, church? Our Lordship to Christ is a doorway to a life of real significance and eternal destiny. Many, many Christ followers will never experience the true awe, reverence and wonder of Jesus because God is still a provider for you. Many Christ followers will miss out on experiencing the reverence for Jesus because God is still your protector. Because God is still your provider, your protector. He's still the one who's, you know, a good teacher for you. But I wonder for all of us if he is the Lord of our lives. There's a difference in, in, in calling somebody, you know, a good provider. And there's a difference in somebody who says, you know what, you own me. Does Jesus own every part of your life? Because if that's, that's the true thing, that means you are giving permission to Jesus to become the Lord over everything. And that's what I want to talk to you about, that it, it, Luke captures this transition where somebody starts off in a transactional way but comes to Jesus because of the reverence and the beauty and the awe and the holiness that he's captured. You know, this is what... And, and John kind of captures this a few years later, you know, where, where many disciples leave Jesus. Not the 12, but there are many disciples who leave Jesus. And then Jesus turns back to the 12 and asks them, do you want to leave as well? You remember Peter's response to that? What does he say? I, I, I don't think the, the, I have those verses put up over here. But he says, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, that that's, that's what happens when you make this journey in your relationship with Christ from somebody who is, Oh God, you're my provider. Oh God, you have helped me, deliver me from this. You have given me these breakthroughs. You have given me these miracles. We go around in circles just experiencing and waiting for another miracle from Jesus. But what Jesus is telling you is that the miracles are to draw your attention to the miracle worker. 
The provisions are the one to draw your attention to the one who's the provider and who's the Lord, who desires to be the Lord of your life. So if Jesus is still your provider, you've got something missing, friends. Jesus desires to be the Lord of everything about your life. Every aspect of your life, Jesus is saying, I want to be the Lord because that's what I came to do. And Peter tells us this thing so well because here's one more thing that speaks into the great transition. It's not just about the, it's, it's one thing where the transactional behavior is kind of cut off in the life of Peter. Peter acknowledges Jesus as the Lord. But here's one key indicator to help you understand if Jesus is really the Lord of your lives. Are you ready for that? One of the key indicators that Jesus is really the Lord of your life, you and I will never be second guessing the impression that Jesus drops in your heart for your kingdom assignment. And what I mean by that is, Jesus calls Peter and he calls the rest of the fishermen as well and he tells them, from now on, you're going to be fishers of men, right? Or like the New Living Translation says, you're going to be fishing for people. One of the key indicators in your life and in my life is some of us are so good at stalling your kingdom assignment. Some of us have aced this piece of delaying what God wants you to operate in. Am I talking to somebody in this room tonight because you guys are now, it's kind of dipping out. So, are you guys here still? Yes. Do you guys have a kingdom assignment? Yes. Do you believe you have a kingdom assignment? Yes. That's one of your key indicators. The way you respond to your kingdom assignment tells and speaks a lot if Jesus is your Lord or Jesus is still your whatever, fill in the blank for your current season. And you know what? If you want to live this, this life as a Christ follower, where Jesus is just fulfilling some aspects that you see in the scriptures, you're going to miss out on the, on the, on the big invitation that he's, he's kind of left before you and me. Where he says that, hey, I want to partner with you. I want to partner with you because that's what Paul says, right? You and I are the messengers of the gospel for reconciliation. We are the messengers of reconciliation in this time and this age so that we can be the mouthpieces of God. And so, here's something that I want to draw and maybe close out with this. One of the reasons we, we are kind of diving into this one simple story that Luke has captured is it's one thing to continue coming on a Sunday to Sunday and talk about calling talk about, hey church, you know you have something to do, you have a kingdom assignment, you have a divine assignment, but there's, I want to bring perspective to what I'm saying. You see, we're getting into a time where, where each one of us is going to start planning for Christmas, right? And I don't know what your plans look like, maybe you have a holiday coming up, maybe you have things happening in your home, maybe now that I'm saying it, you're going to be like, oh wow, I never thought of Christmas, Dinath. You know, thank you for that reminder, you know. But I'm being, I'm teaching us, all of us, including myself, to be intentional about how we can steward your kingdom assignment. So here's what the practical application of responding to this can look like. You and I have a call from God. I think we have settled that long enough. We have been speaking about it long enough. I don't know how many times in different ways I would have to talk to get your attention that every single one of you is called. Every single one of you has been given a kingdom assignment, a divine kingdom assignment. And if you do not own up to that, you are robbing God the glory that he deserves. You are robbing God the glory that he deserves. Because he's the one who's given you those gifts. He's the one who's given you those skills. He's the one who's created you the way he's created you. You're not weird. I'm, I'm trying to think how to complete that, you know. <laughs> y 
you. <laughs> I've got so many thoughts that are there, and I just want to make sure I don't mess up this moment. Uh, I'll say it one more time. You're not weird. You've just been you've just been designed in a very unique and a precious way by Jesus Christ. And so, church, what you see around is what God has already built. The person that who's sitting next to you is God is already at work in their lives. But there are so many out there who do not have even a fraction of the hope and the love that you are experiencing sitting over here and coming over here on a week-on-week -week basis. And what I want to challenge each one of us is to be intentional as to how we steward the next four months about being messengers of the gospel and being conduits of the gospel by just inviting friends into your settings, into your circles, into really seeing the hope that Jesus has given you, into really seeing how God is changing you and how God has changed you and how His, how his love and His grace and His joy is changing every bit of you so that His name can be glorified through your life. And what I'm trying to bring us to is that when the church together operates on that kingdom assignment, when the church together responds to the Great Commission, lives will be transformed. When the church together responds to the Great Commission, hope will be unleashed through our lives. When the church together responds to the Great Commission, people will encounter the Jesus that you and I have encountered. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to keep this Jesus just to myself. I don't know about you, but I don't want us to get so fixated on doing church with the friends that you have made over the last three, four months or the last three, four years in Zealous. Zealous, it's time for you and I to rise up and own up the space that Jesus is already said you have. It's time that you and I really get up and say, God, who can I pray for today? Who can bring me some people so that I can really model the hope of the gospel in their lives and stop thinking that you're not capable enough. Don't let the devil or the enemy or anything in your life tell you a lie that is not even, you know, does not even exist. You have just created that, so those scenarios in your head. See, because what's at stake is that people are robbed of hope every single day. People are being robbed of joy every single day. People are being robbed of peace every single day. And you and I are, are enjoying this, this banquet that Jesus has invited us to. You and I are enjoying this feast that we have been invited to. And yet we are saying, you know what? I want more. I want more. I want to consume more. And Jesus is saying, how much will you consume? Can you? Is that not enough for you? Can you just go out and share with somebody what you have been feasting on? As so you see, it was, it was about the miracle that Jesus did in your life. It was about the breakthrough that Jesus caused in your life. He's not going to take away all that. But the miracle... Is for an assignment the breakthrough in your life is for an assignment the miraculous catch in the lives of Peter and his friends was for a divine kingdom assignment that Jesus has called each and every disciple for and you and I don't forget that we are disciples of the church of Jesus Christ and he is calling us and commissioning us and telling us go into all the world make disciples baptize them teach them the word of God and do this because as you're doing this I am with you till the end of the age and so you have read this, you have heard this time and up, but church, let's just do it, man. Let's just get up, go out there, and do it in simple ways. And so for the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing about how, how we can live this message of the gospel wherever we are, wherever God has placed us, wherever God has positioned us. If it means opening up your homes, learn to do that. If it means setting aside some budgets to, 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 to go out there and just help some people, go ahead and do that. Whatever impression that, the God, that God is putting in your life, on your hearts, just be faithful and obey to that. 
See, Jesus concluded this story by saying that I'm calling you so that you can be fishers of men. I don't think that has changed, church. I don't know about you. I'm not satisfied with a hundred people church. Amen, Ninad. Call it, call it biased, call it arrogant. Pune has got way many people than what are seated over here. And if you and I have been transformed by the hope of the gospel, that gospel has the power to transform the city of Pune as well. And so can we just, can we just stop limiting ourselves? Oh no, I'm, I'm okay. Oh, the church is full. No, the church is not full. There are seven plus million people who may not have heard the truth of the gospel. And for some of them, God is counting on you. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, God is counting on you. No, no, no. Don't whisper this to them. Just, just affirm them, like shake them up and tell them that God is counting on you. Nikhil, you need to talk to Joy right now. Joy, you need to talk. I can do this to them because Joy is my childhood friend. You know, I can just, I can just do it to you, bro. I can't do it to anyone else. Own up. Your kingdom assignment, church. You don't need to wait for a guest speaker to come in. You don't need to wait for a special service to happen. You don't need to wait for a mission Sunday to happen. You don't need to wait for another one year to go past until you have recovered from the trauma and recovered from your brokenness and recovered. As you are being healed, the healing power can still flow through you. As you are being restored, the restoration power can still flow through you. We are not called to build the perfect church. We are called to build a church where the gospel can be preached. We are called to build a church where lives can be set free. We are called to build a community where Jesus and Jesus alone is glorified. And we are called to be the church where we are the hope for the world around us. And so, sometimes I, you know, when, when, when moments like this happen, I was like, God, you have given us so many gifts. You have given us so many talents. But my fear is, church, we'll just waste it away by being so comfortable, by just coming for another gathering, by just coming for another church setting, by just coming for another dinner and a catch-up. And, and the conviction will just keep simmering down. But Jesus is saying, I am making you fishers of people. Thank you for tuning in for that message. We really hope that that has blessed your heart immensely. At Zealous, it's our desire that Jesus would meet you at the point of your need and that you would truly grow in the love and the grace that he has to offer each one of us. And that's why if you have been enjoying the content that has been coming to you, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel to share this content with your friends and your loved ones, and maybe even consider partnering with us as we take the message of the gospel beyond the four walls of Zealous. Once again, it means so much for us when you join in. So thank you for being here with us. God bless you, and may you have a great week ahead.